This is the 91st Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's the largest such plant in Phoenix. Uh, about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, the city was faced with a dilemma because the ever increasing uh, regulations from the Clean Water Act required it to get more and more nitrogen out of its effluent. The plant already does partial tertiary treatment, um, but it needed to come up with a solution to get more nitrogen out of the water of the effluent before it goes into the Salt River. The technological solution to that, uh, that situation would have cost about $5 billion. Instead, they chose a nature-based solution. They built a constructed treatment wetland, which we're going to show you in a few minutes. Um, the total cost of that project was $100 million. And so it's that constructed treatment wetland that was the solution the city came up with to let nature do the work for us. This is where the effluent from the 91st Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant enters the Trace Rios constructed treatment wetland. Um, in the summertime, uh, effluent flows are fairly low, less than 100,000 cubic meters of, of effluent per day, because um, Phoenix's population is fairly low. But in the winter, when our population swells by more than a million snowbirds, we can see effluent volumes entering the system as high as 250,000 cubic meters per day. Um, the other recipient of effluent from the 91st Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant is the Palo Verde Nuclear Power Plant, uh, which is located 60 kilometers to the west. This is where the effluent enters the constructed treatment wetland that we've been working in for 10 years. Um, we've already talked about the volumes of um, flow coming into the system. Uh, the system is 42 hectares in size, half of which is vegetated marsh and half of which is open water. And we're going to give you a tour of that system now. So perhaps the most critical data that we collect every other month is plant productivity and live biomass. We do this along the 10 transects that you saw in the site map in the report um, and we do it at five randomly located quarter square meter quadrats along each of the 10 transects. In each of the quadrats we uh, measure all of the plant species groups um, in the quarter square meter. We have developed phenometric models for all of the species groups of plants out here um, and those phenometric models allow us to get really good estimates of live biomass by making very simple measurements in the field non-destructively. The area around the 91st Avenue Wastewater Treatment Plant is a mix of legacy agriculture um, and residential suburban neighborhoods, developments. Uh, an important component of that agriculture is a large dairy industry um, and a number of uh, concentrated animal feeding operations like you see here or CAFOs that are associated with the largest slaughterhouse in the Southwest, which is located only five kilometers north of us. So as part of the uh, intensive CAFO operations that are happening in this area, uh, this is a very large manure composting facility. It's immediately north of the Trace Rios constructed treatment wetland, and why is that relevant? Well, some years ago we had a PhD student who measured greenhouse gas fluxes um, in um, Trace Rios marshes. Um, he found that uh, the, the marsh is a source of both methane and um, N2O, at the water interface, water air atmosphere interface. Um, but then he also made greenhouse gas flux measurements on the leaves of the cattail plants, the typha plants. And he found that cattails are a source of methane to the atmosphere, but they are a net sink of N2O. Um, and in fact, when you do the greenhouse gas budget, because nitrogen N2O obviously has an almost 300 um, fold influence on greenhouse potential, um, when we do the entire whole system budget, scaled up, uh, it turns out that the entire Tres Rios constructed treatment wetland is a sink for greenhouse gases. Where is that N2O potentially coming from? We don't know yet, but our hypothesis is that that N2O that the marsh appears to be taking up is coming from this manure composting facility. This is fascinating because there are not very many uh, situations that you will find in the literature where a large wetland, let alone a constructed treatment wetland, is actually mitigating for greenhouse gases. As part of our bi-monthly uh, sampling campaign, we collect water samples um, for nutrient analysis. Um, true good samples at the inflow and here at the outflow. This is Dax McKay, the lab manager for the Wetland Ecosystem Ecology Lab, or the wheel as we call it. Um, we also collect water samples at the shore and at the marsh open water interface along three of our transects that represent a gradient from inflow to outflow. Um, DAX also collects oxygen readings and pH and conductivity readings every two months. 
And we use these data to put together our whole system um, nitrogen budgets, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Another thing we do every other month is quantify aquatic metabolism. Uh, we use a standard limnological light dark bottle technique, oxygen concentration change, very simple. Um, the oxygen change in the light bottles obviously gives us net primary productivity, which gives us a way of estimating nitrogen uptake um, associated with primary productivity during the day. And the dark bottles give us an idea of heterotrophic respiration, which is releasing nitrogen back into the water column uh, below the photic zone and at night. And we use this to develop estimates of the nitrogen budget for the 21 hectares of open water in the system. Another thing we do every other month is we make transpiration measurements with our portable infrared gas analyzer. Um, these transpiration measurements are done on all of the species groups of plants. We use these critical data for our whole system water budgets um, and scale these leaf-specific transpiration measurements in space using our biomass measurements. And we scale these leaf-specific measurements in time using key data from the on-site meteorological station. So one of the novel findings that we found using our transpiration measurements and our whole system water budget um, is that transpiration rates out here are extremely high in the summer, which you would expect in a place that's very hot and dry like Phoenix. Um, transpiration rates as much as six centimeters a day we've been measuring, um, and that water has to be replaced. And so we have used tracer studies to demonstrate and confirm that the plants are actually drawing new water into the marsh during the summer. Um, this is a phenomenon we refer to as the biological tide. Um, it's a, a, a first ever um, demonstration of biological control of surface hydrology in a wetland. Um, and we have combined these measurements of the biological tide with our nutrient budgets um, and demonstrated that more than half of the nitrogen being taken up by the marsh here is actually a result of the biological tide. Now, one last ecosystem service that um, we have found about this place that kind of surprised everyone is that it's become an absolute mecca for wildlife. More than 70 species of wetland and aquatic birds call this place home. We routinely see coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, otter, um, and we see lots of evidence of muskrats. It really is an oasis of productivity in the Sonoran Desert.